Welcome back everyone to How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes. In the last two videos we talked about two different training exercises that can help you develop deduction as a habit and a skill. Those two being reverse deductions and half deductions. If you're new to the channel, click on the text on the screen to go to those videos. And if you've already seen those videos but need a slight refresher, I'll quickly review. Reverse deductions are a training exercise where you analyze the actions that you do in everyday life as if you were an outside eye looking to make a deduction. You have the effect, that which an outside eye would see, and the cause, that which you already know to have led up to the effect, but is what an outside eye would not know and would be looking to figure out. This allows you to essentially use the same principles of a proper deduction and apply them to a question that you already know the answer to, thereby allowing you to develop deduction as a habit while ensuring that you are not making improper deductions. Now in a half deduction, rather than observe and analyze your own actions, you take the information that a person has already given you about themselves, such as their occupation or hobby. With this information about the person, the object is now to observe the person in order to find the information that, that would have led up to deducing that fact, had they not made you privy to that information themselves. Now for this video, those two techniques are largely irrelevant to the actual performing of proper deductions. They're merely training exercises to help develop deduction and that process as a habit. Now a proper deduction is what every Holmes fan has seen in some way. Whether in the books, the various film adaptations, or most people's favorite, the television series Sherlock. In essence, it is the process of observation, conjecture, and finally deduction without having any prior knowledge of the conclusion that you are coming upon. For the purposes of explaining how to perform a proper deduction, we must go over the process itself in detail. Now, I've gone over this in various other videos, and I've even written blog posts dedicated to the subject, but I've never gone into the depth that I will go with you now. Now think back to whatever medium you can remember where Sherlock has just made a complex deduction, yet when he explains it all, everything made perfect sense and seemed to be so simple. This is what we as the audience and many times the supporting cast of the stories feel. Astonishment at Holmes' amazing capabilities, yet frustration with not being able to put the simple clues together for ourselves. However, with any luck in explaining things on my part, and determination on yours, we should be able to successfully teach ourselves to think like Sherlock Holmes. Let us begin by going over the three basic principles of deduction. Think of these as the foundation of deduction itself, the pillars that hold up the logical structure that is any given deduction. Once again, these three principles are observation, conjecture, and deduction, in that order. Mastery over these three principles is key to making constant and efficient deductions. In addition, if mastered, these three principles will shine forth in not just your deductions, but your words, speech patterns, actions, down to your very thoughts. Your very being will be sharpened by these three principles. That is, if you have the gumption to put forth the effort into mastering them. To help you understand what it is exactly you are trying to master, I will go over each principle in depth to show you just what I mean. Observation is the key to making any conjecture or deduction. Without information to work with, you have nothing but a question. You have five senses for gathering information about the outside world. Around 75% of the brain's sensory input, however, comes from the visual cortex, which is connected to the eyes. In the case of the eyes being rendered incapable of absorbing light, the visual cortex takes in the information it can gather from the other senses to map out one's surroundings. This is why some blind people can walk around without the use of a walking stick or seeing eye dog. This is an attribute of the brain embellished by the comic book character Daredevil. Now why am I telling you all this? Because you need to recognize the value of all of your senses. We rely on sight for most of what we do because it comprises about 75% of our sensory information. In addition, it is true that most deductions can be made using sight alone. However. A true detective uses all their senses they can to observe. In combination, the five senses can be used to solve almost any question you might pose for a deduction. But now that we have established the importance of our five senses and observation itself, let's go deeper. 
We should never be passively traversing through this world, taking our senses for granted. Trust me, I spent far too much of my life simply going with the flow, barely tapping into the potential of my five senses. Rather, we should be a sponge, absorbing all the information that we can from our five senses. Now, our subconscious mind filters out much of what our senses pick up. This is because at some point in time, our conscious mind has deemed such things irrelevant. Now, a baby or a toddler whose mind is not yet decided what is generally irrelevant, assumes all things as relevant. This is why babies are normally such keen observers. Now, before we go further, let me explain what I mean when I say the subconscious mind. Now, I'm not referring to micro-expressions, micro-gestures, or other such involuntary movements of the body, although these such things are vital facets of the subconscious. Rather than talk about that, for the purposes of this video and this topic, I will be discussing a different facet of the subconscious mind, that being the things that we do consciously without really thinking about it. Now, I know this might seem counterintuitive, but hear me out for a second. For instance, you've probably done this before, you place your keys down on the table and then you uh, go off, do whatever, and you forget that you placed your, where you placed your keys, and so you're looking around for your keys. Now why is this? Well, it's because you didn't put conscious recognition into placing your keys down on the table. You didn't, it didn't register that you were putting them down. Rather, you consciously did the action and it was stored into your short-term memory, but because you did not put conscious recognition into it, your mind deemed it irrelevant. So, that is something that I would classify as a subconscious deliberate action, or a deliberate subconscious action. Thus, for all intents and purposes, my definition of the subconscious mind as it pertains to this area of deduction would be thus. Consciously performed actions without the full attention of the conscious mind, you know, shortcuts in the brain in the form of neurological pathways that are formed of the constant performing of tasks. Holmes had a knack for determining the difference between useful information and useless information. However, unlike us, he did it consciously. So, how do we train our mind to do that? By first reattaining that sensitivity. Now, an average unobservant man, when put into a position of fear, will become very observant very fast. This is because of the fight or flight response, all information is assumed as relevant because anything could be a threat. So, does this mean we should live our life in constant fear? <laughs> Absolutely not. However, you do need an objective, a reason to be observant, a reason that your subconscious mind can understand. Making that reason a primary objective consciously will force your subconscious mind to cater to that objective. Think about it like this. Right now your subconscious mind is on its default mode. Efficiency. It's a survival mechanism. When resources are scarce, the body, including the brain, has to be rationed out nutrients in order to survive. Now, most people who have the luxury of watching YouTube are not starving, so the need for your body to economize all that energy is largely pointless. We need to change the subconscious's primary function from conserving resources to a new primary task, in this case, observation. Now, this does not mean you can observe everything. Nutrients are one thing, but the fact of the matter is that your brain can only handle so many things at one time. In fact, the conscious mind can only handle one thing at a time without sacrificing performance. So in order to be more observant, we have to be more selective in what we observe. A bit counterintuitive, I know, but it, it, it makes sense. I'll explain it later in another video. But your subconscious mind is already doing that selectivity process. What we need to do is take that power and give it to the, sub, to the conscious mind and direct the selectivity process consciously. But how do we do that? No, no, I want you to close your eyes. Just, you know, close them. All right, so I have a question for you. Why do you want to be able to think like Sherlock Holmes? Just think about that for a moment. Did you see the show one time and thought, hey, that would be pretty cool to be able to do? Uh, do you have an uh, interest in a career in law enforcement? Whatever your reason, I just want you to think about it. Now, why is that your reason? Think about that. Now, once you've determined why that is your reason, I want you to make the conscious decision to make that reason a priority in your life starting today. Alright, you can open your eyes. Now, I wish I could say that that is all there is to it, but I would be lying. If it was that easy, a lot of people would have figured it out already. No, making it a priority in your life requires constant reminder. 
whatever you have to do to remind yourself throughout the day, like uh, writing a note on your bathroom uh, mirror or uh, writing it on your alarm clock, uh, writing it on your arm or hand or, you know, anything it takes to get you to constantly remind yourself throughout the day that that is a priority to you. Now, when you catch yourself not observing, that reminder will help you to mentally kick yourself and force you to observe, observe once again, if it is in fact something that you are passionate about. Now, when observing, be selective. Your goal in deduction is simply a priority that you're setting to help you be uh, more selective. Now, for different situations, your observations will need a more uh, specific priority to help guide you along. Such things we have talked about in my Observation 101 series, which you can go to by looking in the link in the description below. I've tried saying that 20 times. It is a lot difficult to say. Try saying it five times fast, you know. Look in the link, look, I can't even do it once again. Look in the link in the description below. The truth is that it simply takes practice. Look around. He, listen to things, smell the air, you know, uh, notice when things brush up against your skin or you bump into things, you know, things like that. Uh, recognize your specific position in space and all that good stuff. Now, we've talked about observation for a little bit longer than I had hoped, but that's the way things go. And I could go deeper, but I already have. So, once again, for more on observation, go check out my Observation 101 series. Moving on! Conjecture. Or, as others have put it, your theory. Now, I prefer to use the term conjecture because it establishes that we are basing our theories off the information that we observe, as is the basis of inductive reasoning, which is the essence of a conjecture. In addition, it is my belief that conjectures are simply what we base our theories off of and not the theories themselves. Now, like my Observation 101 videos, I will be making a video, or perhaps several videos, uh, going more in depth into this step of deduction, but for now, for the sake of this video, here's the crash course version. Now, in this stage of deduction, you have absorbed all the information from the outside world that is pertinent to your deduction via your five senses. Now it is time to let those observations speak for themselves. So to speak. Now, at this point, we are in the process of developing a solid theory that we can then base our deduction off of. Now, it takes a number of conjectures to come upon a good, solid theory. Uh, so, think of your conjectures as brainstorming. You have all the information that you have observed, and based on that information, you then pose a series of if-then statements. For instance, if there is no milk in the fridge, then someone must have drank the milk that was in the fridge. Shocking. Most if-then statements that are used in conjectures build off of each other. That is to say that a conjecture is usually a compilation of many sequential if-then statements. For instance, If there is no milk in the fridge, then someone drank the milk that was in the fridge. If there was milk in the fridge last night, then someone must have drank the milk this morning. If myself and my roommate were, in, were the only ones here between last night and this morning, then one of us must have drank the milk. If I did not drink the milk, then my roommate must have drank the milk. A simple conjecture that intuition could have solved in the blink of an eye, but you get the idea. In a conjecture, the only premises that are accepted are the observations that are made, and the logic that follows must be true if it fits within all the observed information. Now, this type of brainstorming is perfect for the first stages of building a theory, because, for one, it is very in very small steps, so there's little room for error as there's only so much that can be inferred from one observation and it also builds off of itself which is handy. Now because there's such a great margin for error in a conjecture we have to weed out all those conjectures that don't make sense when in light of all the information available. What is left is your theory, an imperfect uh, rough draft of your deduction which is still can be improved but is at least a step in the right direction. Now how do we weed out those bad conjectures? by looking at all the facts together. By this I mean that something by itself might seem completely reasonable, but when paired with all the facts together that concern it, what at first seemed completely reasonable on its own is in fact completely wrong when in light of all this other information. To either confirm our theories and shoot us off into a dazzling show of intelligence or to deny our theories and bring us back to the drawing board, we must now employ the use of deductive reasoning. 
Now, the dictionary defines deductive reasoning as a process of reasoning in which the conclusion falls necessarily from the premise presented, so that the conclusion cannot be false if the premises are true. Why did I close my computer? That's where my script is. A little much to take in, I know, but uh, in other words, deductive reasoning is uses facts to uh, directly examine the evidence that is given using those facts in universal laws as verification of interpretation. For instance, if the fact of the matter is that sound needs a medium to travel through, like air or water or solid, then we can determine that sound cannot travel through the vacuum of space in which there is no such medium. Now, as you can see, this is an if-then statement. These statements are not exclusive to conjectures, rather they are interchangeable between deductive and inductive reasoning. The difference lies within the premise and how it is followed. In conjectures and inductive reasoning, the premise is the observation. However, in deduction, we are simply confirming our interpretations of those observations with established facts in the form of information we have stored in our brains prior that is not visible through the observations of the current environment. The purpose of this is simple. Things don't always explain themselves. You can have all the observational skills in the world, but sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you just really need to have prior information about uh, something in order to be able to successfully dissect your observations and actually interpret and make sense out of them. Now, deduction as a whole is a big probability game. We are constantly balancing the probabilities because that is what we have in the end. A deduction is more likely to be correct if it is broader, but if it is more precise, then it is more likely to be in part wrong. For instance, if you see a uh, grease stain on someone's sleeve, then you can probably assume that they ate something that was greasy. Now, if you were going to venture to guess what particular greasy thing that they were eating, it is more likely that you are wrong. However, that's just the probability of it. The technique and application of deductive reasoning, you can increase your probabilities through obtaining more facts. Thus, in deduction, we are always cross-referencing uh, our theories with all the facts. If evidence comes up that supports your theory, then the probability of you being correct goes up which is great, but if uh, there's a fact that comes up that uh, threads the continuity of your theory, then there's a problem. Could be with your interpretation of the fact, could just be with your theory. What doesn't lie is the fact itself. If you ever come to that point where you're unsure about whether your theory is wrong or whether your interpretation of a particular fact is wrong, simply take all the facts that are pertinent to the deduction and see how they logically fit together. Let them speak for themselves. As much as deduction is a science, it is also very organic, like an art. As such, it is not an exact science, nor is one technique always the best. As such, I cannot definitively teach you how one, how to let the facts speak for themselves. It's something that you get from practice. To help it teach you that skill without endangering your progress in deduction is the whole reason I developed the training exercises of reverse and half deductions. Now, bear in mind that this is not a say-all and all guide to deductions at all. I doubt such a thing exists. This is merely a template for you to base your deductions off of. It's just the logical progression of how you would go about going through a given deduction. Plus, there are a lot of things that I left out. As I said, there will be videos coming in the future and videos that have come already that will be explaining such topics more in depth and clearing up some of the things that I didn't have time to go through in this video. Nevertheless, if you have a particular question that you would like me to clear up, put it in the comments below and I will be sure to get to it in my end of the month Q&A video, the likes of which I have not yet come up with a clever name for. Now, a promise that I will be uploading weekly content from now on, and as I said, videos to come that I have planned will be clearing up some of the things that I left out in this video. Look out for more things to look for videos, see what I did there. Also, I'll be doing more collaborations with fellow deductive YouTuber Sharon Ford Holmes, who has the channel Sharon Ford Holmes Learn to Deduce. The link is in the description below. Go check that out, uh, subscribe to him, see all of his cool content and what we've worked on together.
There are other YouTubers that, like myself, focus their content around deduction, as m many of you know. Uh, the most notable being, of course, Shireport Holmes, and the other being Observe, the man behind which is writing a book which I will be sure to purchase when it comes out, and I recommend that you do the same. He focuses his channel on body language, but is gradually branching out, so be sure to go check him out, subscribe to him, see all of his awesome content, and get good information from that. Again, link in the description. I mentioned that he was writing a book. Speaking of books, don't worry, my review on uh, Mastermind How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes by Maria Konnikova. Did I say that right? Yeah, I said that right. Maria Konnikova. Um, that will be coming out shortly. I have only about 70 pages left to uh, finish, so it shouldn't be more than a few days before that video is uploaded. So be sure to look out for that. I have a few scripts finished and a couple more in the works, which I plan on just taking a whole day just to shoot them all, get them all out of the way, so that I can get ahead, edit them throughout the following weeks, so that I don't leave you guys with, you know, a three week gap in content again. And with that, thank you for watching and thank you for supporting me. Also, I'd like to give a uh, big welcome to all the new subscribers that have been coming in since my last video. Uh, I hope this channel will prove to be educational to the lot of you. And with that, I will see you all next time. Arrivederci.